it's just always been important for me to show people that I see them. Mm. And I think I learned that there, you know, like taking the time to say hi and give someone a hug and ask them how they're doing. And these really kind of basic things can mean a lot to someone who's coming from a place where no one's kind to them or no one takes time to actually hear them or see them. And so those really little things, I think people sometimes take for granted how profound they can be. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy. I'm Jamie, and this is Clever. Hey, before we get started, would you do us a quick favor? Please rate, subscribe, and review us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us a lot. And today, we are talking to Justina Blakeney. If you've ever been on the internet, Instagram, Pinterest, or read a lifestyle magazine, you know her as the charismatic and forthcoming founder of Jungalo and Justina Blakeney Home. She's primarily recognized for her bold interior designs, wallpapers, and textiles, and she herself describes her style as wild, cozy, and homey. She's also noteworthy for being a super badass entrepreneur and has built what seems like a beautiful, warm extension of her authentic personality into a very successful brand. If you spend any time on her site, in her journals, or Instagram, you'll feel like you know her, and then you will want to hug her. I know, because it happened to me. Let's talk to Justina. I'm Justina Blakeney. I live and work in Los Angeles. I'm a designer, author, artist, and entrepreneur, and I do it because I love it. (laughs) (laughs) I felt your joy. I felt it. So... I want to know more about little Justina. I want to know where you were born, where you grew up, what your hometown was like, your family. Like, just give us the whole picture. That took me a second because there wasn't a little Justina. There was a little Tina. What? I was like, I was like, who's little Justina? (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Tina was your nickname as a kid? Yeah, I grew up being called Tina. And, you know, my real name is Justina and I only reclaimed it almost in my very late 20s and started going by Justina again. So there's this like divide of people who call me Tina or T and people who call me Justina. And I always know like what era (laughs) in my life I know you from based on like what you call me. (laughs) Yeah, I don't see you as a Tina. I see you as a Justina. So I must be in this part two. I never saw myself as a Tina. Like it never really felt like totally like me so that's why I went back to using my or I went to using my original my real name um yeah so I grew up in Berkeley in Berkeley California which is you know in the Bay Area it's a university town my parents are were developmental psychologists and growing up they had a school for mentally disabled teenage girls and I kind of grew up there. It's <laughs> so like went there every day after school and hung out with everyone. And when I got older, I, you know, taught art classes in the afternoons at the school and stuff like that. It was a residential program. So it was girls from age ages 12 to 18, or young women, I should say. And they lived there. So because it was a residential treatment program. So I grew up in this really kind of crazy atmosphere you know, growing up alongside this, this school. And yeah, so I have an older brother and a younger sister. I'm in the middle. And I think, I feel like I had a really awesome childhood. (laughs) My parents are rad and they just gave us so much freedom to do what we wanted. And we traveled all over the world and, you know, our families on, on both my mom's side of the family and my dad's side of the family are like, super different. And so I grew up like kind of skating between these, these two worlds in in my family. And then this like third world in in this school, my dad is African American, my mom is of Eastern European Jewish descent, but on both sides of the family, you know, my family's been here for many generations and here in the United States. My dad's side of the family, they're from Central California, and it's a huge family. My dad has 13 brothers and sisters, ah. or sorry, there are 13 all together, and, and I don't even know how many first cousins I have on my dad's side. <laughs> it's like, it's a lot. <laughs> Oftentimes, we'll just like call each other cousin because we like don't know. <laughs> What's up, cousin? What's 
what's up? <laughs> you know, that vibe. And I mean, of course, there was a group of my cousins who, who lived in the Bay Area and, you know, I'm really close with them. And yeah, so it's a huge, huge family. My mom's family, on the other hand, is from Los Angeles. And my grandfather was kind of a successful businessman. And it was just like polar opposites when I would come to visit like my family here in LA versus my family in Central California. It's like two completely different worlds. And, you know, I just grew up feeling super comfortable in both. And I think that kind of, you know, informed a lot of who I am today and how I kind of am able to speak, I think, to lots of different kinds of people and hopefully resonate you know, with them. Yeah. Yeah. I can totally see that. This is all starting to make sense. But I I have to ask you, like, how did growing up around that school inform your feelings about mental health and mental disabilities? Like, did it destigmatize it for you? Did it make it not scary? Did it really empower you to see your parents in in roles where they're doing something so helpful? I mean, that just seems like such a strong environment to grow up in as a child it it had to seep in yeah yeah and I should probably like clarify a little bit sort of like the kind of people that my parents had at the school and at the time and in the late 70s and, and early 80s and into the 90s there weren't a lot of these kinds of programs for girls. Mm -hmm. They were a lot of these kinds of schools for boys. And in California, this was actually the only school that specialized for girls. And a lot of the girls were, you know, brought to the school directly from juvenile hall. A lot of them were abused and neglected and have, you know, very serious behavioral issues, you know, some of the, you know, and lots of like, you know, sexual abuse and, physical abuse, emotional abuse, the whole thing, you know, there were some girls who came in pregnant at 11 years old or 12 years old, you know, just like very, (sighs) very, very heavy kind of lives. And so I think one main effect that had on me was a kind of an attitude of gratitude, which was just this feeling of like, I really grew up with a deep understanding of how terrible some children have it. Oh, And, and, and sort of the the kinds of choices that some people are forced to make at a very, very young age. And, and I also grew up, I feel that I grew up sort of with an understanding of how art can heal. Yes. And how being Mm. in a healthful environment can, can heal and, and in a, in both kind of an emotional way, but also just in a straight, like physical environment kind of way, because you know, having a safe place to live and a, a, a warm bed to go to sleep in at night and a place that's yours, you know, I think it was just so important. And, you know, they always encourage the the girls to kind of like really create home at this place since it was a residential program. And I remember, you know, my mom always enrolling me to kind of help out with that, me and my sister. And so we would, you know, always be doing projects to help or try and help make the house better for them and, you know, more beautiful and more fun and just really being kind of conscientious about the environment and how it's affecting the health and well-being of all the girls. Yeah. We grew up, yeah, like wrapping presents for them at Christmas and getting donations. And, you know, it was just like, it was just, you know, what we were doing. And both my parents were there all the time. So we were there all the time. And yeah, I mean, it was definitely very heavy, but it also allowed me to find a lot of the joy in, you know, things that can often feel dark and overwhelming. Mm. Well, and it seems like you not only did you have a front row seat, but you had an active participatory role in one helping people heal, which you were able to see that process close up. And maybe not heal entirely, but go through some degree of the healing process. And I've always believed that your home environment is your, not only your sanctuary, but your headquarters for restoration and for like being the best you can be out in the world. So totally being able to, in your formative years, grasp that so deeply (laughs) and start to participate in that, that totally makes sense why you are who you are right now. Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's beautiful. (laughs) And so, I mean, can you tell us 
what that looked like in terms of your creativity? I know you were helping the people at the school and teaching art and figuring out that art can heal, but like, how did that take shape inside Tina? Like, what were you finding yeah. really gave you the the creative goosebumps? Well, um, I think just seeing how small things can affect people in a big way and also how, you know, really being able to see people, you know, I, I think a lot of the time, you know, people say, oh, you have such like a large social media audience, but I see you like answer a lot of questions. You talk to people directly and this, that, and the other. And it's just always been important for me to show people that I see them. Mm. And I think I learned that there, you know, like taking the time to say hi and give someone a hug and ask them how they're doing. And these really kind of basic things can mean a lot to someone who's coming from a place where no one's kind to them or no one takes time to actually hear them or see them. And so those really little things, I think people sometimes take for granted how profound they can be. And so I think I really try and exercise that in my daily life. And I think sometimes I do a better job and sometimes I do a worse job, but, but I really feel like growing up, you know, in a position of privilege Mm -hmm. and growing up around people who are, you know, really at the opposite end of that spectrum, it just gave me a lot of perspective, you know, and And as far as like the art goes, I just remember seeing how on the faces of of these, you know, young people, their faces just light up, you know, and and really how through the process of like collaging or painting, it's it's cathartic. I think it's a very cathartic thing. And even in a sort of like a half hour after school, you know, painting class, it was a moment of lightness you know in mm-hmm. a moment of just really being able to kind of relax and and I could see that on their faces you know even when I was like 15 or 16 it was like just so so apparent how powerful art was as a medium to really heal <sighs> yeah isn't that the best feeling ever to see their faces light up it like when they are able to partake in the catharsis but then also have that sort of sense of pride and accomplishment of look what I made yes totally (laughs) no absolutely absolutely and I think you know some of the girls were really gifted you know and just you know never were given an opportunity to explore that side of themselves and I just felt so lucky to be able to be a part of that in even a very tiny way to sort of see someone discovering that they were an artist and that they had just never been given that that chance to to tap into that side of themselves. So, I mean, were you discovering that you were an artist too? I, I read that you went to UCLA. What did you study in college and what were the college years like for you when you're are you are you Justina yet? Or are you still Tina? <laughs> I'm still out, Tina. <laughs> out in the world, like figuring out your own identity. <laughs> yeah. No, for sure. And I think, you know, obviously as someone who's you know, multiracial or, you know, multicultural, however you want to call it. I I definitely, you know, I I had my own identity issues going on for sure. When I decided to go to UCLA, it was really kind of like on a whim. Like I didn't really, I really (laughs) wanted to go to Yale and study theater like Angela Bassett. I was like, I'm going to be like Angela Bassett. I was really into the performing arts when I was in high school. So I always had like an artistic side of myself and a creative side. And, and I kind of always played around in both like theater arts and music, as well as the visual arts, you know, painting and sculpting and pottery and, you know, lots of different stuff, jewelry making, fashion design. Like I was into all that kind of stuff. I knew I was always like a very creative person. I just wasn't really sure what form that was going to take in college or, or beyond. Like I I didn't know what I wanted to do or Uh, how to make a livelihood. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know what like my job thing was going to look like. And right. (laughs) Yeah. So when I got to LA, um, there was, you know, it was a big place and (laughs) I discovered very quickly that I didn't really want to pursue the life of trying to be an actress or a musician professionally. And I think that's probably because I've always like wanted to make money. (laughs) 
And Good for you. <laughs> yeah. I just, I, you know, I, I've always been a really, really hard worker and I've always seen how if you have money, your life is so much easier and it's much easier to help others if your shit is on lock. <laughs> that, so it took me forever to really grasp that because I was really struggling with this, like, am I materialistic if I want to earn money or like, can I be creative and, and earn without selling out? Like all totally. of that baggage that comes with a creative lifestyle. Mm-hmm. I really struggled yes. with. And I then did it too just, for a while, but it was. It just yeah, became I mean, so clear to me that you can do more good in the world. Yes. If you're not suffering and struggling totally. yourself. <laughs> yeah, that was definitely a light bulb moment for me as well. And I, I mean, obviously, it had a lot to do with this sort of very split families that I came from, where on one side of the family, you know, people are all like, stru- I mean, not all, but like maybe 90% of my dad's side of the family is like struggling financially, you know, a swaths of people who are on vacation, aka in jail. Um, dealing with drugs, living on the streets. And a lot of it was, you know, a socioeconomic situation Mm -hmm. that a lot of black folks in the United States are born into. And it's very, very difficult to climb out of it. Yeah. And then on the other side, I've got my family in LA where my grandparents are living in Bel Air, you know, in this large, beautiful home with fancy cars and taking the families on vacations every year. And it was like, I grew up in both of these settings. And so both were normal to me, but I definitely could see how (laughs) living with money was was more the kind of lifestyle I was trying to lead. (laughs) So I, you know, for my first couple of years in college, I was going to school and I was working at, at a theater. I was working at the Geffen Playhouse in Westwood. And I was, you know, I had agents and I was going on commercial auditions and I was modeling on the side and I was like, hustling kind of trying to get my acting slash singing thing off the ground and after going to like a lot of auditions and having some like very minor successes I was like I don't like this hustle (laughs) yeah it's a lot of work for very little payoff and it's all random (laughs) totally and it's like you're you're like fighting for scraps That's really how I felt. And I felt like, you know, like becoming financially successful in that industry to me meant like living a long life of like basically like crap shooting and a lot of like people kind of sort of tearing you down based on your physical, you know, look. And, you know, as someone who was never skinny or thin and as someone who was biracial, I also didn't really fit into a lot of categories like. I remember really clearly being at a casting one day and the woman was, the casting agent was on the phone and she's like, no, I'm here with the light skinned Lauren Hills. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking around at all the other women in the room and I'm like, oh, damn, we are all like light skinned Lauren Hills. So it was just, you know, it was fun for a couple years to kind of like try that out. But I mean, I, I pretty quickly realized that instead of tapping it or instead of like trying to pursue a career in the performing arts that I, that I wanted to go into design. And so I sort of made like a conscious decision. I even sort of remember the day that I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do this. I'm going to study design because to me, design was like the way to be an artist that like made money. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, It just seemed like, and and I don't know if that's even necessarily true, but in my, you know, 21 year old head, it was like, oh, okay, this is how I can do art, but also like make a good living. That, um, I made the same calculation. I went to fashion business school because I'm like, fashion is creative, but business is business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so that's when my design pursuits started like seriously and I am an Aries and I am like a a super go-getter and you know, when I make a decision about something, I put a hundred percent into it and I have been for the past 18 years. So if you started to pivot to design, was that something where you were like, were you still in school at that point or were you graduated and you were like, okay, I'm just going to start learning about sign. Like how did you even get started? I was still in school and, and I was already in a department called world arts and cultures, which is a special program that UCLA has. And it's kind of a mix of sociocultural anthropology and, and art history, you know, roughly it's like you study 
you know, art, contemporary art and art history, but then you also like dig into cultures around the world and, and their artistic practices and stuff like that. So, oh, that sounds awesome. You just made me want to go back to school. <laughs> it was awesome. It was such an amazing program. And it started just a couple of years before I started at UCLA. And it it really was just so great, especially for what I'm doing now. It's like still so relevant to to everything that I'm doing, which I feel like isn't often the case when you get your BA, right? You get it in something super random and then you end up doing something completely different. But this is super relevant to what I still do. A lot of people who graduated from the program ended up working in like museums and and that kind of thing. So so that's what I studied. And when I decided I really wanted to study or study design, learn more about design and, and be a designer, That's when I decided to go abroad and live in Italy to study design there. So I took my junior year and moved to Florence, Italy, where a lot of the major fashion houses are and dropped out of school just for that one year so that I could sign up for this particular program that had a lot of design classes and spent the year living in Italy and studying design and Italian and, you know, a few other fun things like like cooking. (laughs) Like pasta. Yeah, and... like lasagna and vino and uh-huh. hot Italian guys. So I was studying a lot of hot Italian guys. <laughs> yes. And speaking of hot Italian guys, Florence is the home of David. And I like, yes, he's a pretty hot Italian guy. He is I a remember very hot Italian guy. <laughs> seeing him in person, my heart fell out yeah. of my chest. It, it's. I think I was, so I ended up staying in Italy for seven years and I was in a constant (laughs) state of my heart falling out of my chest for seven years. Whoa. um, Living there. Like I, I fell in love. I just, I fell in love with everything. And, and so, yeah, after that first year at, in Florence, I came back to UCLA. I finished my, my last year of school and moved back moved back to Italy, moved back to Florence and ended up staying for six and a half more years. Doing, I mean, just were you learning the whole time? Were you (laughs) thinking you might live there for the rest of your life? Were you just being a free spirit? What was Girl, it was the Bush years. Oh, thank God you got out of the country. I was like, (laughs) bye-bye. I, yeah, so I didn't really know. And that was part of it. It was like, I sort Mm -hmm. of, Felt like I wanted to do design. I wasn't sure exactly what that meant or what form that was going to take. I've always really have been interested in language arts and and I have an ear for languages. I speak six languages and it was just really fun for me to sort of be a foreigner and be in a constant state of being pushed outside my comfort zone. And I tend to excel when I'm put in an environment like that. I don't like things to be too easy. <laughs> I want to like continuously be challenged. So, wow. For that first year when I moved back after UCLA, I signed up for a school called Polimoda, which is the FIT sister school that's in Florence and I did a certificate program in fashion design. I did that mainly because in order to stay in Italy legally, I needed to have a student visa. Mm. And so you know, I was in school and you're also allowed to work part time if you are a student in the EU, even if you're a foreign student. So I was going to school and I got a job and I was working at a literary agency and I was doing translations. And when I say literary agency, it sounds a lot more grandiose than it actually was. It was basically like a guy smoking cigars in a room, like yelling <laughs> things at me. And then I was typing. <laughs> And that was a really interesting job. And it was really interesting because I didn't really know what I was doing, but like I was, I was doing a really good job of pretending. And he was like, I want a website. It says on your resume that, you know, you, you do some design stuff. And I was like, yeah, okay. Yeah. I'll figure it out. So that was my first experience. Like I designed the website for the literary agency, like figured out how to get it online, which was like t- kind of like weird. I was like, I don't know how this stuff gets up there and the internet. Like, no, still, this is, gosh, what year was this? This is 2001, <laughs> right? Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh-huh. I remember. I started to just like, and I've always been like that, like very self-taught and just like figuring out, you know, how, how to do things on my own and 
And so I taught myself how to, how to design and program websites for that job. And that was actually a really key thing because through the next like 10 years of my life, as I was doing lots of different kinds of work, I was doing like graphic design and web design stuff kind of in the background to make money. Mm -hmm. So after that year of Polimoda, I was trying to figure out, I wanted to stay in Italy. My sister moved to Italy as well. So we were there together and we're like, we want to stay. What can we do? How can we figure it out? And my boyfriend Danilo at the time was finishing up his law degree. And so he was really instrumental in figuring out how we could stay in Italy. And the way to do it was that we started our own business and then hired ourselves as the CEOs of that business in order to give ourselves green cards. What? (laughs) This is fascinating and awesome and very (laughs) DIY in the best possible way. (laughs) Working the system. I love it. Working the system. I mean, we slept at La Questura, which is like the police station where they give you your your green cards because we were in line with like, you know, hundreds of refugees trying to get asylum. And like, you know, it was a very crazy experience trying to, to get our papers, but we did it and we started our own business. And so, you know, we had, we had made up this business and now we're like, okay, well now that we are allowed to do it and we're allowed to stay, we've got to like figure out what we're going to (laughs) do. So we started our own design studio and it ended up taking many forms. At first we wanted to do handbags. Florence is kind of like the Italian handbag capital, like all of the leather factories and where all the handbags are made are right outside of Florence. And Every company from like Gucci to Pucci to Prada, like all of the Italian leather companies do their leather there. So we started designing handbags and getting stuff made in in the factories nearby. And we're looking for a little office space when we stumbled upon a very tiny space that had a storefront and it was 400,000 lira a month, which was $200. And it was in the historical center of Florence. And we were like, oh my God we could have a store. And so Ah. we ended up opening up a little store. (laughs) Oh my God, so fun. (laughs) It was so fun. It really was. (laughs) It was so fun. And at this time in Italy, like vintage was not a thing. Okay. That was big. And, you know, I grew up in Berkeley and like coming to LA all the time. We'd shop Melrose with my grandma and, you know, we were big vintage people. And so we were like, we're going to open a shop that has, designs from our friends from the fashion school that we just finished that year long program in and vintage. And so we opened up this little shop. It was mostly clothes, but we also sold like Ojedar and like, you know, smalls and things. And I was shopping on eBay and getting stuff sent. And we were like going on weekend trips to different parts of Italy and even into like Germany and Switzerland and other places shopping and that was my life for the next like five years. Damn. Oh my God. <laughs> like a fantasy. It really I mean, does. times aren't like that now. I mean, there's some nostalgia baked into that too for when things were cheap and when vintage was an idea you could really get behind. <laughs> totally. And I mean, we were so naive. Like our I, I was so naive. Like We had no idea what we were doing. You know, when I had decided to go to UCLA, it was in part because my mom and dad said to me, look, you could go to one of the fancy East Coast schools if you want. You know, I'd gotten into, you know, a handful of kind of liberal arts schools that sounded really dreamy. Or they said, when you graduate UCLA, you'll have $20,000 to like figure out like what you want to do. with." So I had this like seed money basically because I had gone to a public school that my parents gave to me. And so, you know, at the time, $20,000 lasted, (laughs) like I could really stretch that out in Italy for, for a long time. So, um, but I will say that in those five years of running that store, we never made any money. Like we made enough money to like live there and, and not a penny more. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But what better time to do that when, you know, you're in your twenties and like, I, I regret nothing as far as that whole experience, (laughs) except for maybe one of the boyfriends I had, (laughs) (laughs) which is important too. (laughs) So fast forward to now, like there's so much, I, I assume that happened between then and now, because now you're living in LA, you have this 
what I believe to be an empire uh, of the, the Jungalo and your blog and all of these products you're designing and all of this art that you're making and your books and all of that. So what is the path from Italy to the Jungalo? Yeah, well, I, I really think it all started with a book. And the book was kind of a pet project that I started when I was living in Italy. And on one of my trips back to the U.S. to renew my visa, my sister and I, you know, hit up like every Salvation Army, all the rag houses in downtown L.A. I don't even know if those exist anymore, but back then there were lots of rag houses. They had piles and piles of clothes and you could just go in there and search for, you know, in mountains for denim and T-shirts. And so wait, so we just would, quick question. So you're talking yeah. about a book you you wrote, not a book that you read. Correct. Okay. So, and then also, am I hearing your gardener in the background? Yeah, you are. <laughs> okay. So we were bringing back basically suitcases full of vintage t-shirts and they were selling really well. But one of the issues is, is that Italians are small and Americans are big. <laughs> <laughs> and so we would find these really great t-shirts with cool like vintage logos and stuff on them that did really well in Italy, but they were just humongous and that just wasn't the style. So my sister and I started customizing the t-shirts and so that we could basically make them fit our Italian audience. And then we had the idea to turn that into a manual. And so the first book I ever wrote was called 99 ways to cut, sew, trim, and tie your t-shirt into something special. And we got some of our friends from fashion school. We all got together, camped out on our sofa, smoking joints and drinking wine, like, and working on this manual on this book for like 20 hours a day for three weeks until we had a invitation to come show at Piti Uomo, which is this big trade show that happens in Florence every year. And so, you know, they gave us a little booth and we created this thing called the Style Clinic. And, you know, people could buy a T-shirt and we'd customize it for them on the spot. And what ended up happening is that, like, this thing went viral really before the days of the Internet. Like, it went viral as much as something could go viral before the Internet. <laughs> also, because I should say that the Internet, while here, it was like probably already, you know, booming in 2001 mm -hmm. um, or 2002, we didn't even have internet in our homes living in Italy. Like it was, we had cell phones and that was it. Like we had to go to internet cafes if we wanted to like check mm -hmm. our email. So in a way we, I was kind of insulated from like everything that was going on here in the U.S. So we were kind of basically spawning our own little like DIY movement in Florence. And once we published that book, we got offers from literary agencies in the U.S. because we had so much press around it that we got from that trade show. And we were sending books out one by one. And we obviously self-published the book, but we were sending them out one by one. We'd get a call from Japan to the store, and then we get a call from Austria, and we, get, and we were getting calls from all over the world. So we ended up hooking up with an American literary agent who sold the book to Random House. And we ended up doing four books with Random House after that, you know, cut your denim, cut your scarf, you know, blah, 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 blah. And about halfway through the second book, I had been in Italy by then for almost seven years and I was ready to come back. So I moved to New York City. And, you know, I had, you know, a couple of published books under my belt. I was in my mid 20s. I spoke fluent Italian. I, you know, I had done a lot of consulting when I lived in Italy, you know, whether it was like translating or design work. I told you I was like designing websites and stuff. I designed stuff for Elio Fiorucci, who is the, the big legend behind the Fiorucci denim brand in the 80s. And so like I had a really impressive resume, even though it was very like weird <laughs> 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 and very like freelancey and you know, mostly everything was like in Italy. So it wasn't like anyone could ever call for references. And I moved to New York and I'm thinking, okay, now it's going to be my time to like, start like figuring out how to like really have a career and make some money. And so I started working freelance for magazines and I was writing for basically fashion and culture magazines. And it was around that time that I also started my blog. And this was like 2007, 2008. And I was living in Brooklyn and you know, working freelance, I was doing everything from like tutoring in Italian to designing websites and logos. I was an editor at 
a now kaput magazine called Venus Zine. Oh my and god! Was, do you remember Venus? <laughs> I loved Venus. It was so good. Yeah, it was really great. So I did that for several years, and it was like a very hustly New York, but I'm still poor kind of life, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and it was hard. I had a really hard time in New York. I think mainly because it was very, very, very different from the life I. Like I, I, I was ready to be like a small fish in a big pond because in Florence is so small and insulated and I was so different from everyone there that it was like I couldn't take a step without someone like stopping and talking to me. So I was kind of excited about like the anonymity and like being in, in New York and just trying trying something completely new. But it was like I was like too small a fish and too big. A <laughs> I was like, oh wait a second like it's really hard to do anything here (laughs) and so at the time I should also put in a parenthesis that I had started dating this cute guy from Los Angeles named Jason who is now my husband so I was kind of in this like long distance relationship with him being here in LA and me being in New York and I after two years in New York doing you know writing and editing and some you know light graphic design I moved back to Los Angeles and that was 10 years ago. God, I'm getting old, y'all. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> Just wise. Just wise. <laughs> so when I came back, um, I, I sort of made a commitment to myself from blogging just sort of every now and again, which is what I've been doing in New York, to starting to work on my blog every day. And throughout this process, I was just getting more and more interested in home decor I kind of like wanted to leave fashion behind. I, I just, I had tried lots of little things in the fashion industry and it just never really sat well with me. I just, I, it was just felt very judgmental and weird and very cutthroat. And, and so on my blog, just because of my natural interest towards home decor, I started, I started talking about home decor and my style, especially because of you know, how much I traveled growing up as a kid and having lived in Italy for all this time and loving vintage and old things. And it was just really different from the style of a lot of people who were, you know, doing blogging back then, especially in the early 2000s, when things were very, like, white and monochromatic. Mm -hmm. And like, I just remember, like, seeing so many interiors where it was like, all white. Mm -hmm. And then maybe there would be like a couple of black things. (laughs) <laughs> and my style's just always been so colorful and so full of life and plants and you know old things and things from my travels that that was just sort of the natural like eclecticism of of who I was and how I was raised and and so what I started what started to happen really quickly was people were like oh wow I haven't like seen stuff like mm-hmm. this that much and and then it took, you know, years, but that was really the start of, of Jungalo and, and of, of what's now my empire. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so speaking, speaking of Jungalo, not only did you invent a word, you kind of invented the style and you describe it as being wild and cozy and homey. What are the essentials of that style? Like, what's your creative process like, too, when you start designing something? Where does all of that come from? I I really do think that most of my inspiration comes from my travels. So, you know, and then I have this whole other story, which would be, you know, uh, enough to talk about for a whole other podcast about my, my plants, (laughs) my plants passion and, and, and how that started and, and why I'm so obsessed with plants and why I think it's so important to have plants at home. But it was really sort of marrying this passion that I have for plants with, the passion that I have for the way people live in different places other than like what I've experienced for the most part here in the United States. One of the things, so I skipped this about the Tina years, but (laughs) my parents took me to Switzerland when I was 13 and we lived there for a year. They were doing a sabbatical at a, at a Swiss university. And so you were surrounded by the super green rolling hills and the Alps and, and yes. the, oh my gosh. Yes. And the water is this like amazing minerally green crystal it's, clear. The colors are insane. Yeah. And there is also a, a really amazing sort of functional culture. The Swiss, like they're known for like 
functionality. It doesn't sound very sexy, but it actually <laughs> is very sexy. Like, like everything works really well in Switzerland. Yeah. And the way that the homes are laid out and the way that people live there is like, to me, like the most like feng shui kind of thing that I had experienced. You know, it was just like the refrigerators were small. And I was like, why are these refrigerators so small? It was like a hotel room refrigerator in people's homes. And it just has to do with the fact that they grocery shop a little bit every day and only keep fresh food in the fridge. Like, you know what I mean? It's just like the, yeah. the different like way of living, which, you know, I really feel that, you know, so I, I spent that year in when I was 13 living in Switzerland and I decided when I was 16, I wanted to go back. And so I lived with a host family there. And, and, and so I spent two years living in Switzerland before I was 17. And, you know, that's why I learned to speak German and I learned to speak French. And I, I learned this other completely different way of life that felt really healthful to me. The Swiss felt very wholesome and healthy. And I like was kind of trying to understand like why that was. I was like eating cheese and yogurt and chocolate every <laughs> single day. And I came back like 30 pounds later than when I left. Like for you just, just, just just because I was living there. It was like magic. I was like, yes. oh my God. <laughs> Those things are joyful. And if they're not super processed and if they're fresh, I mean, the totally. Swiss are also known for their neutrality, but it seems like maybe even a better way of framing that is they're drama free. If they're totally just that paring is. things down to the essentials and not trying to engage in stuff that's unnecessary, totally. then you can focus on what's important. No, 100%. And it was also like, the host family that I live with, they did really well. They were, you know, they, you know, had money and they lived in a very beautiful, but modest size apartment, which to, for me, like growing up in California was very strange because anyone like that you knew that had money, they probably weren't going to live in an apartment. Right. They were going to live in a big ass house. Right. So there were just all these things that just got me thinking. And I think a lot of it was subliminal, but like that I was like, oh, like there are other ways of living that are great and beautiful and healthy that are just really different from the way that we do things in the States. And so, you know, it's, to me, it's the travel and, and that's where all my inspiration comes from, from Jungalo. It's like, you know, I, I traveled to Morocco and, you know, spent a few weeks there. I traveled to Mexico many summers. We went to Indonesia for a month when I was 10, like, I just had all of these varied experiences and saw, got to see, got to experience how different cultures were using color in different ways than we are, how they were using print and pattern. It just, it, and it wasn't like a, you know, necessarily like anyone was sitting there and being like, Oh, this is how we use print and pattern mm -hmm. in Indonesia. But it was like, I got to go to a batik factory when I was 10 and, and see how resist dyeing worked and like watch the artisan, you know? And it was just like mm -hmm. that kind of informative experience growing up was so it, it just became a part of who I was. And yeah. I, and I also feel like because I, I come from a background that's sort of culturally diverse, I really felt like I was connecting with these different cultures in, in a lot of different ways. Like I saw myself in the Moroccan, in Moroccan culture, because it was this beautiful mix of like, Bedouin and often Jewish tradition, you know, mm -hmm. and my mom's family is, is Jewish and, and it's North African. And, you know, my mm -hmm. dad's family is from Africa and there are all these Mediterranean influences. And I spent all those years living in Italy. It was like, I just could like see myself in a lot of these different cultures. And so I felt like I was just really taking everything in and just really connecting. And, and so bringing a lot of those design ideas back with me, from these travels is really, I think, sort of at the heart of, of what I do. It's, it's about mix mixing, you know, mm. and mixing the best of, of what I've seen in, in my life to me, like uh, when, when I say the best, I mean the things that bring joy and peace and that drama free vibe you were talking about before, yeah. <laughs> where it's like, I want my home to be drama free. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, so I recently went to a talk and they, they talked about the differences between style and lifestyle. And when I think about mm. what you're doing and around the time when you started doing it, which was like, you know, 
oh seven, oh eight, oh nine, when blogging was really just starting to get moving. And you said there were all of these like white boxes with like maybe a black chair in them. And that's kind of when I started too. And I was one of those blogs where it was all white interiors with black chairs. No, no shade girl. No shade. Yeah. yeah. And so <laughs> she like, built is amazing. you kind of differentiated yourself in, in the sense of like, I think of you as lifestyle and those other blogs and all of the magazines as style. Because what you infuse in your design is more than just, I'm going to put this vase on this table. Oh, look at this plant. You're bringing together history and texture and, and life to objects that are inanimate. Don't make me cry. Don't make well, me cry. <laughs> it's not like it's, you're not like composing a room so that it looks good. You're you're composing a narrative that people can feel good in. Oh, thank you. That's that's really what I like am trying to do and what I'm I hope to do. And I, I think part of it also comes from the fact that I'm not a traditional designer. And I didn't come from that background. And and so sometimes I make choices that are counterintuitive to someone who's maybe been, you know, actually designing other people's homes for a long time. And I tried doing interior design as a job for a couple of years in my early LA years as my blog sort of started to get gain popularity. I had people asking if I could design their homes and I tried a few and I was just like, I, I just didn't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I didn't enjoy the process. I felt like I was being stifled creatively and Mm -hmm. I was, I really just didn't, didn't feel like I could fully express myself when I was doing it for other people. So I sort of took this, I I pivoted a little bit to say like, well, instead of designing other people's homes, I kind of want to try and help people figure out the kind of home that that they'll thrive in. But I kind of feel like that's like a personal thing and it's difficult for someone else to come in and create that for you. And so that's really what I've been working hard at for the past, you know, five or six years is, creating space for people to create space for themselves Mm. and their families. And, and I'm not sure if I could have that same approach if I had had a traditional like interior design kind of training or background or something like that. And now because of the direction I've taken my business in, like I spend, I mean, I spend a good chunk of my day on the computer, but most days I get to do at least one thing that's like painting or drawing or creating, you know, styling a vignette for, for a photo shoot or, or those kinds of things. So I really do feel like I get to be creative in my work and, or designing, you know, furniture pieces or that kind of thing. And, and so I've sort of been able to craft this life where I can be the artist. I also get to do kind of performing arts in a way when I do, you know, speaking engagements or, you know, brand ambassadorships, and I get to be in front of the camera and kind of share my light and my story. And I really do feel like, this journey that I've been on, I almost sometimes feel like it's like Slumdog Millionaire. Do you guys remember that movie where <laughs> yeah. he had all these like crazy experiences, almost like just so he could win that million dollars? <laughs> yeah. I sort of feel that way sometimes about my own journey where I'm like, I don't think I couldn't have gotten to where I am or, or be doing what I'm doing if, you know, I hadn't, you know, learned how to design those websites really early on and, and lived in Italy and like learned about, you know, vintage and modernism and, Um, like every little weird like route that I've taken has been sort of instrumental in bringing me to where I am today. So it's, it's pretty, pretty bizarre. (laughs) It's pretty bizarre and awesome, but it is awesome. (laughs) You can't do all those random things without, you know, please tell me there was a hiccup or a a fork in the road or a God or a challenge or a failure or a like, head scratcher in there every day okay every day day. can you tell us a a story of a failure or a mistake one to make us feel better about ourselves and two so that we can learn (laughs) from it oh my gosh I I have so many I don't know like I'm trying to think of one that's like more specific to work so this is a really a really big one a really big hiccup which is that you know so I have been very transparent With the fact that, you know, I am money oriented in many ways. So I'm like trying to be a good business person. And for so many years, I didn't know what that meant. And I'm still definitely learning. But one of the things that I did early on with the Jungle Instagram account was create the hashtag Jungle Style. 
Mm-hmm. And I was like drumming it into people's heads. I'm like, find your jungle style. This is jungle style. What's your jungle style? Like until, you know, we have almost a million like tat. I don't even know how many I, have, I haven't looked in a long time. But last time I checked, we were around like 500,000 with like people's hashtagging jungle style and just like really proliferating this, this movement and this message. And so as I was talking to an attorney about, you know, my work and this and that, and she's like, well, do you ever plan on selling your business? And I was like, honestly, if the price is right, like, yes, bring it, you know, just because I'm always sort of looking ahead and seeing, seeing what's next. And she's like, well, then you really need to stop using jungle style as a term. And you can't really be proliferating your brand as a style because you're genericizing it. I was like, oh, <laughs> record oh. scratch. Uh, uh. <laughs> She's like, you're turning your brand into a generic thing. Whereas anybody puts like a basket and a plant on like a colorful tablecloth, it's jungle style, but none of those products are yours. And so we had, I had this whole, like, it was a crisis. <laughs> I was like, I can't use jungle style. And at, meanwhile, I've been like screaming it from the top of like mountaintops. It's in articles like from, you know, Architectural Digest to El Decor to like, you know, everywhere. And all of a sudden she was basically telling me that I was going to be making it impossible to sell my company eventually if that's what I want to do. Mm-hmm. If I continue to like tell people to own to, to own this style, which is what I really wanted. And it wasn't just a crisis of of sort of, oh gosh, you know, what if I can't sell this later? It was really a crisis of, this is my message. Right. I want people to to take this and run with it. And how do I do that without harming my intellectual property? And it was like a real crisis. And I'm not even totally out of that crisis yet. What the main thing that I did was just stop using the hashtag myself. <laughs> and that was like, pretty much it. There's not much else I can do. Um, but, but that's just one example of, of, a, of a pretty serious hiccup. And, you know, now I've been working closely with like an IP lawyer to make sure that all of our intellectual property is protected. But yeah, I mean, but seriously, like, I mean, we go through so much at Jungalo, like, for every, I mean, everyone's like, oh my God, you're blowing up. You have so many partnerships. You have so many of this, you have so many of that. I'm like, for every one thing you see that comes out, there was 10 that was like in the pipelines that whatever, for whatever reason, didn't work out. Mm-hmm. Oh, I Yes. The amount of effort that goes into one project also encompasses like the 10 projects that got started, but never got off the ground or exactly. All that and it's literally R&D like, went yeah. into it and it just fell through for some reason yeah and it's so like it's so many and it's such part of the process now that I literally like and and you know I'm blessed to have a lot of opportunities come my way but I am never I don't even tell anybody about anything I don't until it's like almost done Mm -hmm. because so 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 much of the time for reasons both in in my control or out of my control, things don't work out, mm-hmm. and 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 that happens way more often than than it happens that something does work out. Right. I had to negotiate with my parents when I tell them about stuff that that might happen. I had to tell them, but you're not allowed to ask me any updates <laughs> on it until yeah. I because they just totally. want to hear good news, right? So they're exactly. like, so what's going on with this? What's going on with this? And mostly yeah. it's like, I don't know. Well, when will you know? I don't know when I'll know. It's <laughs> yeah. like, well, the timeline's totally. out of my hands. And then that and just makes them frustrated. So I'm like, you're not allowed to ask until I have good news for you. And then I will, you will be the first people I tell. <laughs> I know. Well, that that's, that's just totally my same situation. And then the other thing that, I mean, I think I should say to put all this shit in perspective is that now I've been running Jungalo for 10 years. And I know that from the outside, everything looks like really big and empire-y and crazy. But on the inside, like the inner workings of the business were still really small. I have three full-time employees and then it's my husband and I, and we, you know, he helps me with a lot of different stuff, but he's the primary caregiver to our daughter. And we're still totally struggling financially. Basically every dollar we have goes back into the business. And 
I haven't figured out how to make that piece of it work yet. And I've spent, you know, the past decade building this brand. And now that the brand is built, I'm like, okay, well, now is really my time to like figure out how to make money because there are definitely months where I'm taking out loans to pay our mortgage. So just know that even though shit seems really like amazing and da 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 da, and it is, and I'm grateful for all of it, we are not like <laughs> bawling. <laughs> Man, I just want to hug you right now. Like, thank you for sharing that. The perception that people have of successful people is is often just skewed because the Internet, you know, can present this really glorified portrait. But it can sometimes conceal the hustle and the struggle because that's not good for the brand or good for business. But it's honest. And, you know, we're both living in L.A. There's a high cost of living. I love it here. But it, yeah, it's it's, it's hard. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I pay myself a salary now, you know, I, I make $55,000 a year and I can't really pay, I can't afford to pay myself more than that yet. So that really, I think puts things in perspective for people because, you know, that's not a lot of money (laughs) in LA. It's really not a lot of money. And, you know, and that's why when I have opportunities that come by and people like, Oh, you would sell the jungle. It's your heart and soul. I'm like, it is my heart and soul, (laughs) but I've also, have lots of other ideas and lots of other things I I'd be interested in trying out and, and all this. So for me, I really do have that entrepreneurial spirit and I am really ready to like cash out at some point and like <laughs> feel, feel that comfortability that I've been like knowing for years and years and years. That is one of my, you know, goals. Right. And, and I, so, I yeah, can that's where feel the universe tingling with that acknowledgement and something's coming your way i just feel it for sure girl from your mouth to god's ears as my mom would say (laughs) okay i want to switch gears real quick because you have a daughter yes and i want to talk about motherhood and the hustle for a minute like how do you feel about all of that (laughs) <laughs> right now, today, in this moment, I'm feeling really good. <laughs> um, we, you know, we have one daughter. Her name is Ida. She's five. She's finishing kindergarten tomorrow. Mm. And it's it's so magical and it's so lovely. And we tried for many years to have a second child, but it just didn't happen for us. And I decided not to go the route of fertility treatments. And so this is our family. This is us. And I think I'm really starting to like own that and kind of appreciate what that can mean for us as far as like being able to provide her and travel and, and, you know, things that I might not have been able to do with, with more kids. And so, yeah, it's, it, I, I've put a lot of things in place lifestyle wise to make it so that our lives are chill, given the fact that I'm like a pretty busy entrepreneur. One of those things is that my studio is one block from my home. And so, you know, I I learned that living in Italy, our store was underneath our our apartment. And so they call it Casa Bottega. And so your casa, your house is, Mm -hmm. (laughs) is under your Bottega. And so when I moved back to to LA, I was like, I want Casa Bottega. Like I want that lifestyle, Mm -hmm. even though it's not a normal lifestyle to have in LA. And so what that means is that, you know, I finish work at five or six and I'm home at, you know, five Oh five. (laughs) Right. And so it takes the commute out of the situation, you know, same within the mornings. Like it just makes it so that I can spend a lot more time with my daughter, which is amazing. And she's amazing. And then also having my husband be the primary caregiver, was a decision that we made really early on when my career was sort of starting to take off when she was really little and he was in a career that he didn't love. And so we just made that decision and it's been, I think the best decision we've ever made because we couldn't afford to have like a nanny. And it also took a lot of the like mommy guilt Mm -hmm. of me being away a lot, knowing that she was just with her dad, you know, all, all day long. So was really for our family it's been really amazing now that my daughter's a little old our daughter's a little older my husband's you know working with me more and more and he's an editor so he's doing a lot of editing for us which is great and he also is HR 
our office, which is, I know we have such a small office, but I hate doing the HR stuff. I hate the hiring. Mm -hmm. I, you know, everything that goes along with it, quarterly reviews, all that stuff. Like I just, I hate it. So he steps in and helps with that stuff as well. So it's been really, really great. And I feel like we have a very balanced life and we're about to do something for myself, my husband and my daughter, which is like life goals to me which is that we're putting a pool in our house, <gasps> like in our yard. Oh, <laughs> that's so exciting. Oh, I yeah. love it. So oh. we're taking these little steps to kind of like create the life that we want to have, even if it's like in a small way. So like we're talking to the contractor about the pool and our yard is small. Our house is small and our yard is small. And he's like, no, this is not a pool this is not a pool. This is a spool. Small pool. <laughs> it's a small pool. It's a spool. We're like, you can call it whatever you want. It's going to be ours. <laughs> oh, but so, even just to hear the, like, the giggling of your daughter when she jumps in the pool and the splashing of the water, like, all of that is the soundtrack of joy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's really what it is for me. It's like, you know, everyone's like, oh, why are you putting a pool in your house? That's not going to increase the, like, you know, sales value. I'm like, well, I want a pool in our house because I want to swim every single day. I want to take meetings for my jacuzzi. Mm -hmm. Like for me, it's all about quality of life. Right. And so like, if I can do these things and we're going to take out a loan to put this pool in, I don't care about the resale value. Like we're going to stay in this house for a long time. I put my heart and my soul into this house. We love it. We're not having any more kids. So like, even if I do end up selling the jungle and making millions of dollars at some point and you know from my mouth to god's ears now but like <laughs> <laughs> you know we still want to be here and and live in this house and have this life that we've built for ourselves this jungle -o. so that's that's kind of i love it that that makes me really happy and it seems like it like all the puzzle pieces are really locking together because it seems very swiss too your casa bottega is drama free and that you don't have a commute you've really designed your lifestyle so that it doesn't have anything that's unnecessary but you can focus on what's important and i really tried to yeah. yeah okay so i have like a random question you mentioned Bring it on. <laughs> you mentioned earlier on that you're an aries and you're a real go-getter and you you just hustle What's your rising yeah. sign? And then like, where are you? Are you really into astrology or are you just kind of casual about it? I go through like moments of being really into it. And then I go through moments of being casual about it. My rising sign is a Scorpio. Oh, and, um, yeah, girl. So don't, don't, don't fuck with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I really do like see a lot of fire and water in myself. And I think that's like, you know, when I'm, when I, when we are hiring people and, and going through that, I, I like always tell them, I'm like, you have to be able to keep up with a really fast paced environment, but you also have to be really relaxed. Can you do that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's like how I am too. I'm like, I'm East coast during the day, but at night I'm California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like there's this like kind of like apex of like working really hard and like having that hustle, but also having like a really relaxed attitude and vibe and taking things as they come and like not stressing along with like the Aries and the Scorpio and all that. Like I'm very susceptible to other people's energies. Mm, and yeah. and I know so, about that. Right. And so mm -hmm. I really like think it's very, very important to surround yourself with people whose energy matches yours or that or fuels yours. Because I think it's, you know, I've had experiences in the past where I've been around people whose energies or, you know, what, however, their their fire, or their water, or whatever it is, their air is just fucking with my fire or my water or yes. my air. <laughs> and and so I just really think it's it's about that balance and and, you know, again, like quality of life to me is everything. And so, you know, I try and hang out with other Aries. I try and hang out with Libras. I try and hang out, you know, or depending on what I want. But, you know, I feel like I'm a very sort of like even person. Like I don't, I don't like my, I, I, I put my passion into my work mm -hmm. uh, and my family, but I'm not one of those people who's like volatile, and I don't like volatility like that kind of freaks me out. And it's probably in part like due to, you know, how I was raised and seeing, you know, so many kids with 
Yeah. Who grew up in such like volatile kind of like family, family lives. But for me, it's really, it's really about keeping things like even and, and whole, you know? I'm really glad you brought that up because volatility should be considered a destructive energy. And because it's not tangible and the ripple effect of it is often hard to quantify, it's, it's really hard to, for people to wrap their heads around. But volatility is almost always a destructive energy and results in a lot of wasted and, and traumatic experiences. <laughs> totally. And there is such a difference between, I think, like a passive kind of volatile situation that you're in for whatever reason, or like deciding to change yeah, something. Yeah. Right. So, and, and there's just such a, such a clear distinction in my mind about how bad one is for me and how good one is for me, but things changing all around me when it feels out of control is, is very unsettling, mm-hmm. you know, but making, you know, a decision that you're going to change something or move to a different country or start a new business oh, or that's agency. You know, the, there, there might yes. be some turbulence that comes with it, but yes. that is agency. Yeah. Yes, 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 exactly. Exactly. So would you say you've reached peak Justina potential or? Oh, hell no, girl. <laughs> okay. So, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Where, what areas are you like right now in this space and time? Are you challenging yourself to grow? Like, where do you need or believe that you need um, to raise your vibration or improve? Yeah. Well, I think one thing that's so fundamental is my physical health. And it's definitely something that with me has a tendency to take a backseat to other things. And I'm also very physically lazy. Like I could sit in front of my computer for 12 hours without standing up if I didn't have to pee. <laughs> Tell me about so it. I, re- I really have to force myself to exercise. And that's definitely an area of, of growth. And I go through spurts of like being really into it. And then I go through longer spurts of like not being into it. So yeah, that's, that's a really big one for me. And then other things are sort of on a more emotional level or something like that. One of the things that I'm working really hard on right now is speeding up the process time at which I process my emotions about things Mm. so that I can address uncomfortable Mm -hmm. issues more swiftly. Mm -hmm. Because what keeps happening both sort of in my personal life as well as in my work life is that I'll like marinate on things or ruminate for so long before I'm like able to bring it up with someone that it's like almost becomes less relevant or something like that. Yeah. And that's one of my husband's strengths. Like if I ever say or do something that like hurts his feelings or, you know, he didn't think was cool for one reason or another, like he'll tell me right there and then. And I really like admire that because it just allows us to like squash beef immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I definitely have a tendency to like, drag that shit out and like talk to people about it and like ruminate. And I really want to get better at that because I just want to be able to face issues head on. I'm also kind of like people pleasery slash like, you know, avoid conflict vibe. And so for me this year, as far as personal growth, I've really been focusing on what I'm calling getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Okay, so I have a couple of quick follow up questions. How? How are you getting comfortable with being uncomfortable? And then secondly, I struggle with what you are outlining as well. And I've isolated that for myself. I'm really uncomfortable with other people's disappointment. And so Me too. because I feel their energy so strongly, I don't want to create a situation yeah. where they're going to feel a negative energy that I'm going to feel then dub like from an empathetic perspective and then also yep. from a very like physical perspective. But yes. it's really helpful to recognize yeah. that the quicker you squash that, the quicker everybody's like boundaries are reinforced and everybody's confusion is eliminated and everybody feels better. And there might be an initial disappointment, but it dissipates really quickly. Yeah, totally. So the way I've been, the answer to your how question yeah, is is what I've been doing is trying to listen to my inner voice more Mm -hmm. because oftentimes 
someone will say something to me and I'll respond in my head. Yeah. And, and, but on my face, I'll just like smiling and nodding, (laughs) you know? And so what I've been really trying to do is to, when I hear that inner voice, actually just saying it, which is hard. Mm -hmm. Like if it's at work and one of my employees does something that makes me feel uncomfortable, it's really hard for me right then and there like like so say last year last year if someone did something kind of drastic that I wasn't happy with I would like basically like log it or talk about it with my husband and then like we'd bring it up at a quarterly review and like or not right you know (laughs) and like that's the kind of beef I'm trying to squash immediately so if someone does something at work at home in my family life a relative whatever it's like And if I'm saying in my head, like, no, but that's actually not accurate because of this, that, the other, I'm like forcing myself to say it out loud. I'm also sitting in awkward silence. Okay. Yeah. Those are two really good strategies. And that's been so hard for me. Like I oftentimes will just like fill the gap. Like if there's awkwardness, I'll like talk, like talk through it, you know? (laughs) Mm -hmm. And, and so, yeah, one of my getting comfortable with, with being uncomfortable things is if I say something and it's like, you know, I don't like continue to try and explain it. If there's no response on the other end, I just sit there and like, wait for them to say something. (laughs) Yeah, I mean. mm. it's hard it's it is. really hard because it's like so awkward and like all I want to do is make nice all I want to do is make things feel good but yeah so so those are those are some big things I'm working on right now just for myself and yeah and and it's hard and, and then of course there's the business stuff which sort of you know on that side I've, I've always been like I'm not a good business person I don't know math I'm not good at numbers I you know this that, and the other and what's become so so clear to me like over the years of running this business is I actually am a really good business person yes and you are thanks thanks yes, yeah are. I have been like hard on myself about that because like I don't know about like investors or like NAS. I don't know what NASDAQ is <laughs> like stuff like that I'm like I don't know about this stuff and you know my accountant last year was like you know your 401k you're this you're that and I'm like I don't know what any I don't I don't have any of that I don't know <laughs> I need help like what I mean especially since you know I was I was in Italy for all my 20s. You know, I was there for, you know, from the time I graduated from college until I was damn near 30. So, like, I missed out on a lot of stuff. When I got back, I um, didn't have a credit card. And people were like, oh, just go to Macy's and I'll give you a credit card and you can start your credit, you know, whatever, like that. So I was like, okay, cool. I went into the city. I went to Macy's and I got denied. (laughs) So I've just been, like, learning about all this stuff. But the the bottom line of, of what I really have learned and of watching people who I consider to be really savvy business people over the years is, is that business is about people. Hmm. And if you can be good with people and if you can read people and if you can convince people of things and if you can, you know, share your message in a powerful way, that's like more important than any of, of, of the other sort of like terms that I might not be familiar with yeah. or, or even math, you know, because it does, I can, I can have someone do that for me. Right. You know? yeah. I can't have, exactly. you know, I, what I can't have someone do for me is, is, you know, build a brand. Right. So speaking of your brand, Jungle O, Justina Blake, Nihalm, you talked a little bit about exit strategy, but do you have any other big goals, whether they're long-term goals or short-term goals? I do. I do. So one of the reasons why we're still kind of struggling financially is because um, all the products that we currently have out, and it's a lot, we have 14 licensed collections out right now. I I know I can barely keep it straight. Crazy. (laughs) Yeah, it's a lot, but it's all, it's all licensing, which means that we get like a small, a small percentage of each sale of each item. And last year we launched our online shop at shop.junglo.com. And that was one way to kind of help pad the fact that like, if we sell a hundred thousand dollars worth of pillows, we're making $7,000. 
and, you know, or 4,000 or 5,000, depending on, you know, what our royalty rate is after taxes. That's not a lot of money Mm -mm. (laughs) for a hundred thousand dollars worth of pillows. So one of the things that I'm currently trying to figure out is carving out a category that I can own myself and do the manufacturing on, which is really scary. And I've been avoiding it for many years, A, because the licensing is so fun and relatively easy because I'm just focusing on creative and marketing. And I don't have to deal with like going overseas or dealing with manufacturing and, and all that stuff. I can lean on other people for that. But if I'm ever to really make, you know, a a decent amount of money, I have to be manufacturing my own stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of sort of on the horizon that the shop has definitely helped with the financials, because if I'm able to get the retail margin on my stuff, then at least I'm earning, you know, 54% instead of just the four, the four percent. So there's just been this huge push this year for us with our online shop. And we've been for the first time ever since in, in my whole history of, of doing Jungalo, been actually investing in marketing. And, you know, I have an amazing full-time employee who just does that. So it's like, it's for me, it's a, it's a lot of discomfort because I'm putting a lot of money in up front, which is not something that I'm used to. Cause I'm used to kind of like being so DIY and like figuring things out and, you know, not like spending more than I have and, you know, all that, but really it's, it's very difficult to grow without an injection of of money. So, you know, I've been taking out loans and, and dealing with now I've, I spent last 10 years actually working on my credit. So now I have good credit and I have credit (laughs) cards and so I'm like figuring it out little by little, but it's really about that ownership piece. And I don't want to manufacture everything. And I'm, you know, weary of manufacturing and, and having to basically learn a whole new like side of the business. But I also know that if like just licensing isn't really going to be enough to float my, my business and my family and, and everything else and, or my, you know, my life goals basically. So do you have a, a short term thing that's coming out or something you just launched that you want our listeners to know about? So I think probably the thing that I'm most excited about right now is our textiles. So I have a textile line and it's probably my favorite thing to design also just because it has so many different applications and, you know, they're all taken directly from my watercolors or my pen and ink drawings. And we just came out with a new line of inside out fabrics. And so it's a performance line. It's the most eco-friendly performance line on the market. It is like um, stain resistant. It's UV resistant, mildew resistant, bleach resistant. It's it's like super fabric. <laughs> super fabric. Space age. And, you know, it, yeah, totally. And, and yeah, I'm really, really excited about it. It just got picked up. Um, if you're a designer, you can get it at Fabricut. If you are not a designer, you can get it at Calico Corners. And what's just been so fulfilling for me and so exciting and so fun is starting to see people get creative with my fabrics and um, do things I never would have thought to do or imagined to do. I have several people online right now reupholstering the insides of like Airstreams. <laughs> And stuff like that. And it's just so much fun for me to see my artwork being used in this way. And yeah, for me, this is like more fulfilling than than designing people's homes, because what I'm doing and kind of brings back to what I was talking about before is that I'm like inspiring other people to get creative on their own. Yeah. Mm. And that to me is like the holy grail. Like that's really what I'm after. That's what my books, the new Bohemians, that's what those books are about. That's what my blog is about. And whether you love plants or hate plants or love color or pattern or hate color or pattern, like I want you to like be able to create the life you love in the home that best supports that. And so to be able to like make fabric or furniture or whatever that is and like you know, inspire people to do something they never thought they'd do with their sofa or their window treatments. Like for me, that's just so fun and exciting to see. That is Tina helping those girls at the school (laughs) 
find catharsis yeah. and healing in their home. It's full circle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I've definitely gone through moments of like, you know, my parents just did so much like good. I mean, they saved so many people's lives, you know, and the school has been closed for 20 years. They lost funding. Mm-hmm. But one of, of the things that has always struck me is I even have people reaching out to me on social media. Like I went to Berkeley Academy. Your parents saved my life. Oh. I, you know, I, I had, you know, I now have, you know, a family, I'm a social worker, you know, just, hearing these stories from these women 20, 30 years later, I'm like, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so it sometimes makes the work I do feel frivolous, you know, because I'm like, oh my gosh, my parents like did so much good work in the world. And here I am like at high point drinking (laughs) champagne, talking about my new rug line or whatever. And I'm like, gosh, you know, I want to be doing good in the world and I want to be affecting people positively. But then I'll have these moments where someone will reach out to me and say, you know, I read your book and, you know, I re I redid my whole house with, you know, these tips and ideas. And I feel like a better version of myself. And so I like to think that in some small way, even something as seemingly frivolous as design really can increase people's quality of life and, and really can help people grow. And I'm going to get teary just thinking about it, but it's, it's, it's just been so, so amazing. And I feel so grateful to be able to be an artist and have that kind of effect on people. Well, we, we love that you're doing it. And Jamie and I both really feel strongly in the power of design and you're a clear example of you know spreading the seeds of goodness <laughs> oh my god my you guys what? <laughs> I can't. all right okay so ah, bring it back <laughs> where can people follow you and your brands on social media if you're more interested in seeing pictures of my delicious daughter <laughs> of my life of what inspires me of weird up close artistic photos of plants and the behind the scenes. You can follow me at Justina Blakeney on Instagram. You can follow my brand. If you're looking for interior design inspiration at the jungle. and you can follow all my design work, all of our projects and a peek behind the scenes of how my designs come to life at Justina Blakeney home um, you can follow also on Facebook, same at the Jungle O, and probably the best way to keep in touch for things going on with our store or events or speaking engagements or all that kind of stuff is to sign up for our newsletter and to visit our shop. So that's all at the jungle at jungleo.com. We got rid of the the. That was another thing that our intellectual property attorney let told us to do. We got rid of the the. So it's now just jungleo, jungleo.com or shop.jungleo.com. Great. Well, yay. Thank you for sharing your personality with us and infecting us with your joy. Oh my gosh. Thank you guys. I'm like, okay, now I got to start my Wednesday with tears in my eyes. Thanks no. a lot. No. Well, now you can walk over to La Colombe and get your coffee. Yes, girl. My oat latte is waiting for me because I've become real bougie. Thank you, Justina. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. All right. Let's talk soon. Bye. Holy moly. She's a powerful woman. Yeah. With a I, lot of like, a lot of, I don't know, force for good. Yeah. I didn't know a whole lot about her story pre jungle So that was really enlightening to, to hear more about all of her travels and living in different countries and speaking all those languages and all of her, you know, setting up a store <laughs> that make, you know, that sells vintage and vintage and handbags in Florence. I mean, that's like, those are like the adventures in your twenties that like everybody dreams of having. <laughs> yes, totally. I also can completely see how teaching art to the girls in this residence, this school, anyway, they came from environments that were traumatic and needed healing. And she saw firsthand how how art could do that of course that's going to make a strong impression on somebody and it just 
you know, drives the knife in even further that we're cutting all of the arts programs in education in the United States. And I think that's a bad trend. It's not good for us, Jamie. It's not good for society. No, art can be so cathartic and healing and stress relieving and just it feels like play sometimes and it makes you happy and that joy can permeate like every other aspect of your life absolutely a hundred percent it's also a critical component of innovation and if we ever want to be like tech science leaders the art component of that at a foundational level is super important because that's the creative application of all these enabling tools right Why don't we run for president? I think we should. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, it sounds like a really horrible job. I know. Honestly, I'm pretty good with just having a podcast at this point. Me too. (laughs) (laughs) But I am am impressed with not just what Justine has built, but the authenticity with which she's built it and the transparency with which she conducts herself. In business and in creativity. She feels she feels really accessible as a person. Yeah, and she's very honest and forthcoming with information. I mean, she has no problem explaining like her financial situation or, you know, issues she had, you know, being biracial or, you know, she didn't fit into a lot of roles because she wasn't stick thin. I mean, she she's very honest and accepting of herself and who she is yeah. and being able to kind of give that awesome energy out I know and I feel like I just absorbed some of that awesome energy and I feel better about myself she's a positive force thanks for listening please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and go to cleverpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter read the show notes and see images of Justina's work Connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Clever Podcast because we really like hearing from you. This episode of Clever was edited by Ty Navaris and Alex Perez with music by L1011.